Welcome back to the channel. Hope you're all keeping safe and well. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Martin Lipton, uh, Chief Sports Reporter at the Sun newspaper, writes about football, rugby, cricket, golf and Olympic sports, previously worked at the Mirror, the Daily Mail and the Press Association and of course is a Spurs fan. Martin, thanks so much for joining me. How are you? I'm very well. Uh, can I just apologise before we start? If I'm a bit sniffy, I've just finished a black bean and chorizo stew that my wife made and it was quite spicy. So I should be OK in about 10 minutes, but there's, there's, there's nothing nefarious, I promise you, in my rather uh, odd, odd sniffy habits at the start of the show. Excellent. Well, in today's show, um, Martin, I'll be asking you about your professional career, covering Tottenham, supporting Spurs and, of course, the transfer window. Let's get straight into it. Um, what's it like being a sports journalist? It's better than working. It always <laughs> has been. Um, I'm incredibly fortunate, Chris, and I always have been. I've been doing this now for... Uh, well, I've been a journalist since 1988, which is ancient history for most people. It feels, feels like ancient history for me. And I've been a sports journalist full time since 1993. Um, so I've done it for an, you know more than half of my life. And yeah. I'm, I'm only 55. I might look older, but I'm only 55. Um, and I still can't imagine how I've ended up doing it because it's just it's given me opportunities to, to travel that I'd never have been able to, to afford to do given me an, uh, the chance to be uh, have a ringside seat at so many incredible sporting events, not just football, but I was at you know the Tokyo Olympics. I was at Augusta a couple of months ago for the Masters. Um, I've watched rugby, test cricket. I, I mean, I've been incredibly fortunate. Um, football is first among equals, there's no doubt about that. And have, this will be my, my seventh World Cup when I go to Qatar um, in November. I've been to umpteen Champions League finals and uh, European Championship finals, etc. So I've been been extremely lucky, and it's enabled me to uh, to be paid to do my passion, which is sport, mm. um, and I, and I love it, and I still do. And even though even the bad days are better than days as an accountant or a lawyer, I'm sure, even if they might earn a few bob more, they haven't got the richness of experience that that I've been able to have, and. Just have the fun we've had as a, as a journalist, you know, going out as a, as a group, having a few drinks and then a few meals, talking rubbish because that's what you do, you know, but strongly held opinions is another face for it. Uh, and get, getting paid to talk about sport is about as good as it gets, really. Martin, what's your um, what's like the favourite events you've covered to do with Tottenham over the years? Well, I. I... There haven't been too many because it's <laughs> not recently, certainly. I, I did enjoy the, the 2008. Uh, Champions, uh, sorry, the League Cup final because actually won something. That was great. Uh, don't, kid, don't, don't worry. Later on, we will be talking about trophies and the lack of yeah. them. We'll definitely uh, cover that. As a kid, I remember going to to big games. You know, at Spurs, eighty four uh, UEFA Cup final. It was fantastic. And I was what eight, 17, 18. Um, the the. The, ma the two moments that stand out actually were last and first, actually. The last game at, at White Hart Lane, when I stayed behind in my seat, I was very lucky that Simon Felstein, who, who you know very well, who was the head of comms for, for yeah. so long at first, um, because I was writing my book at, at the time, he put me in with all the legends. So I was sat next to Ledley King and Peter Crouch and all these little people in that little enclosure in the, in the, in the stand. And... That was just a great experience for me to sit there. And I made, I waited till everyone else had gone, effectively. I was one of the last people out of the stadium that day because I wanted to, to say goodbye my own way. And then being able to take my, my son, who's now 12, so he was nine at the time, uh, to the first game at the new stadium, uh, which I ha can't pretend I wasn't bawling in tears because it just it meant so much as a Spurs fan to see this the ambition and dream and hope become reality a, a ground that is worthy of a big club and more than that the best football ground new build football ground i've ever been to absolutely mm. astonishing um crucible of sport and we saw that arsenal game a few weeks ago what it can be yeah. when the, the team is right and the fans are right and the and the situation is right and that is something that We'd always, as a Spurs, as Spurs fans, dreamed and hoped, without ever really believing it. When Daniel Levy tried to sell us the vision of the stadium, you wanted it to be like that, but I don't think anybody really thought it would be. And yeah. it, it turned out to be everything that that Daniel had promised us. And I thought that was just a, a magical moment for me, as a supporter. I mean, sorry, 
I'll just say the uh, the Stuart got in my nose. Um, the yeah, you know, I went a couple of weeks later for the City game, and that was that was remarkable. Actually, it's a great game. You know, winning the game against all odds, with them missing the penalty, Son scoring the goal. Um, and obviously, as a fan watching on the telly, watching that Ajax game, not as a as a reporter who was just a fan on that day, and not being able to believe what I was seeing, because that doesn't happen to Spurs. And I can't be telling, again, I was in absolute bits. And my, my boy had, when Vertonghen hit the bar, Oli gave up because he was, not, I said, nine and thought, oh, and I just said, they don't, no, they've done brilliantly. You know, it's, they come, so it's, it's not good enough. But he storms up, up to his, his bedroom. And by the time he gets up, st- upstairs, I have started screaming. And I don't stop screaming until he's downstairs. And the two of us, like idiots, hugging each other, each other and, and running around the room. And that's what football does to you. And even as a reporter, suppose, supposedly um, level-headed and neutral. No, you're not. I'm in, it for, uh, I'm in sports reporting, football reporting, because I love football. And I love one club above all others. And, you know, it doesn't bother me when other teams win. But it means more to use a phrase that apparently other clubs are only other clubs in Merseyside are allowed to use. It means more when it's your team. And it actually does mean more when it's your team. Not only for one team, for everybody. It means more when it's their team. Is it is it hard though, Martin, when you're reporting and writing stories about Spurs as you have done over the years, is it hard the fact that you support Tottenham? I found it as a rule, when I was on the mirror particularly, I found myself being more critical of Spurs right. than I would have been because I didn't want to be accused of being too biased towards them. Yeah. Um, and I think that was important that I should could show a degree of professional dis- dispassionality in, in that re- regard. Not always easy. You know, when they when they hold on for a nil-nil against AC Milan to go through, having been pretty much on the back foot all game in that, that uh, last 16 match in the Champions League, I can't pretend I wasn't very, very excited with a massive beaming smile on my face. But you've got yeah. to write what you see. And if that yeah. means, you know, being critical of them, you have to be willing to do it. And I think, as a rule, I tended to be even more critical for fear of being accused of giving them too soft a ride. But I'm willing to plead guilty to that because that's the fan in you as well, because no one's more critical of their team than most real fans. Yeah. It's easy to be a fan of a team that's winning. It's much harder to be a fan of a team that's, that's not winning, that's letting you down, that's frustrating. And it also means that the... If you accept the lows are what they are, it makes the highs all the more exciting and more vibrant and more real because you don't necessarily expect them. You don't necessarily take them for granted. You want to cherish and relish them. And I think that's that's always been part of it with me. Martin, why Spurs for you? Sorry? Why Spurs? Oh, it's my father, I'm afraid. (laughs) Took me when I was five. Um... (laughs) Yeah, I remember the first game was October 72 uh, against Stoke, won 4-3. And I looked it up and uh, John Pratt scored two, I think, from memory. Um, And that was it. One was enough. I I remember we stood on the shelf, so that's a long time ago. And um, my dad used to take me for quite a long time, not every week, but when we could go. We lived in Walthamstow at the time. Um, and my father used to, and he'd been a Spurs fan, grew up. He was born in 46, so he was the right age to see them win things. Um, and he was telling me, even as a little boy, about that team that he'd seen. And I sort of heard those stories. And we would drive around the North Circular from Walthamstow, and we he would blag his way past the copper to try and park close to the ground. And we'd walk through, and we always left 10 minutes before the final whistle to try and get home. That was always irritating, but that's what we did. Um, and yeah, that was it. And it's, you know, he's come from a family of Spurs fans as well. You know, his brother is a big Spurs fan. So, you know, he's a, he's a North London Jew. So that adds to the the luster of it. You know, he grew up in, in sort of Stoke Newington, Stanford Hill, that sort of area. Um, and so it becomes an ancestral birthright, doesn't it? And it's part of part of your, your, the fabric of your being. And so from the very early age, even though we moved out to Essex when I was 10, was only one club when I got my, you know, my first Spurs kit when I was about six, and I used to get them fairly regularly. Um, and I go when I could, and I, and then as I got older, I go on my own, and you know, I, or I go with some mates, and we get on the train from 
place called Whitford where we live near out near Basildon into Liverpool Street and uh, you know go, do it that way it was it was part of my upbringing and and, and a rite of passage in many ways and I you know I love going and even when it wasn't great it was great and when it was great it was fantastic you know and I was lucky enough to watch Hoddle and his pomp and prime and you know knew every game you see something from Glenn Hoddle that would take your breath away absolutely yeah. incredible the talent the man had the ability to spin on a sixpence and play six 50 60 yard balls with either foot out of nothing to to put one into the top corner or thread the ball through for for one of the strikers i mean he was a, a, a magician with the ball without question and so when you've got players of that quality and he started you know he was 17 when he made his debut in 74 when i was seven eight so all through that really formative period through my you know uh, primary school years, Glenn Hoddle was in the Spurs side. And so therefore, how could you not want to support a team with him in it? Martin, what was it like writing the first article on Spurs or, or going to that press box for the very first time? First time I went was in 93-4 season to work. I, I'd done some Spurs stuff, uh, bits, but only you know, just writing about things from other papers, as it were, when I was, on, uh, when I was working for... Uh, an organisation called UK News, which is an evening paper service, yeah. basically, set up by Westminster Press and, and Northcliffe newspapers. And it had about 30 titles up and down the country. Uh, but they sent me to Spurs versus Swindon. A one-all draw. Yeah. Uh, Paul Bowden scored for them. I think Jason Dizelle scored for Spurs. Dizelle, yeah. Um, and, of course, in those days, the, the press room was a porter cabin in the car park. Uh, but it meant I went into the press box for the first time and I realised, A, it's the best view in football and also the worst simultaneously because you were so low, you couldn't see the far side of the pitch, but you were so close, you could hear every word the manager said. And it was fantastic in that regard. And yeah, mm -hmm. it was like, crikey, what am I doing here? This is just bonkers. That is me working at Spurs. Um, and I remember I ended up pulling Colin Calderwood because... One of the papers in our group was a Swindon advertiser. Colin had joined Spurs from Swindon as well. And I got him to speak about, you know, the change between the two clubs, which was perfect for, for my titles uh, at the time. And it was it was incredible. You know, you're just suddenly thinking, I want, I want to keep doing this. Um, and lucky enough, I have. Um, and that included being, you know, harangued by various Spurs managers. They didn't like my, my questioning. Jerry Francis was a... An absolute case in point. He thought it was a real pain in the backside and asked too many questions, probably because I was a real pain in the backside and asked too many questions. And I had a up with, um, with David Pleat once, and I love Pleaty to bits. He's brilliant. But he did give me a, a real going over one day for, for for hanging around outside the training ground and asking questions he didn't want to ask because that's my job, you know, and you've got to be willing to, to get a bit of stick sometimes, and I did. Uh, but also, I mean, I've been incredibly lucky that I've got, I know people at the club, and have done over over years, um, and have been very very privileged to be able to to you know see some things behind the scenes as well occasionally. Martin, did you cover that following season ninety four ninety five, which I always call the Klingsman season because that was incredible. Well, I'd moved up to um, Leeds then or Huddersfield, working for the Press Association. But of course, okay. the first game of that season was Sheffield Wednesday versus Spurs, which yeah. I went to. Um, which was a, a brilliant game because obviously that was the Klinsman swallow dive after he um, after he scored his goal, uh, yeah. and a fantastic match. And Spurs played brilliantly, so I saw them a few times that season. I mean, I, um, including the the cup game against Liverpool, the quarter final win, the two one win, um, which is again as a Spurs fan that was fab as you can imagine. Uh, yeah. But I wasn't because I was based in the north, and my patch was basically Birmingham to Newcastle and all points in between. I only saw Spurs on a handful of occasions that season because I was watching the Northern games. I was basically watching United and, and Blackburn. Mm. Oh, well, Blackburn, of course, won the Premier League that season. And I was um, in Liverpool when they won the title. So it was, uh, it was, yeah. was quite fun because everyone, everyone was still not knowing what was happening at West Ham. And then just as Redknapp scored the winner for Liverpool, which could have killed them, the news came through that United had drawn, so it didn't matter. Mm. Martin, we'll come on to talk about transfers shortly, um, but I want to talk a little bit about last season. Of course, it felt like a very long season. We waited 70 plus days for Nuno Espirito Santo to be appointed. He was then sacked after 
uh, the defeat at home against Manchester United. Antonio Conte came in. How would you describe last season? I think it was the most frustrating and yet also the most positive season. I, I As my boy said to me uh, just the other day when we were talking, he said, that was the best defeat we've ever had against United. It's the best result last season, yeah, I think. <laughs> absolutely, because it was, it was a sliding doors moment, but yeah. in reverse. So the team that lost won and the team that won lost, which doesn't you know, defies normal sense. If Spurs had won that game, Conte could have ended up at United and Nuno would have gone two months later. Crikey, I've no idea who would have come in. I always thought he was a terrible fit from minute one of day one. And part of me still wonders, ponders, thinks that they knew it wasn't going to work. But they also believed there was a really good likelihood that by November, Pochettino would be available again, that he was going to be sacked by PSG. And they didn't fancy the aggravation of Conte because they knew it would be expensive. They knew it would be a trial and a test every every hour, let alone every day. And they felt slightly wary of it and thought, actually, we can get this fella in. When it doesn't work, or if it doesn't work, we'll bin him off. It won't cost us a lot. And Potter will be available and we'll be all right because we can build again. And we decided we're not going to let Kane go come what may. Or we will if they offer us enough money, but they're not going to. So, right, we'll play hardball. And then we'll we'll make it, we'll, we'll finish fifth or sixth, and then we'll build again next season under Pochettino. I think that was probably where, where things were, were destined to go. But it was so bad under Nuno that that couldn't last. Yeah. And that rupture became absolutely inevitable. The good thing was that it happened relatively early. The better thing was that they could persuade Conte to come in. And what really is important is that they bought into what he wants. And a consequence of the club buying into Conte, the players also have bought into him because they know it's long term. It isn't just till the end of the season. And then there'll be a row between the manager and Lee, Daniel Levy and he'll go. Everyone's on this in the same song sheet, which is really, really important. And then we saw some mixed results at times, some really good performances and some pretty awful. You know, he went, was it eight or nine un, unbeaten at the start? Looked really yeah. good. And then they had that blip of, of poor results, um, all either side of Christmas, going through actually into February. You know, there was great win at City and then some a poor, a desperate performance against um. It was the Burnley, uh, Burnley. It was the Burnley defeat, and then the Middlesbrough defeat in yeah. the FA Cup. It was these Middlesbrough types of results. Awful, yeah. Truly, truly awful. Uh, and they played really well at Leeds in between that. So how did that happen? Um, that week when they lost at home to Southampton and Wolves, and you thought, "Oh, crikey, this is all falling apart." And then, then the two new boys found their feet properly. Ben Tancur and Kulusevski. Everything changed. And there was suddenly, uh, you know, Romero came back and was fit. Doherty, who looked to me, little boy lost for the fir for his first two years at the club, it seemed, suddenly looked like a player again. But when he gets injured, uh, Emerson at least doesn't make too many mistakes. He was no Serge Aurier, let's put it in those terms. Mm. Um, and, you know, Davis was excellent as a fill-in on the, on the left of the three. Did really well. He's found a player in the end in in Cessignon. And of course, if you've got the solidity in in the back six or seven, with the three you've got up top, you're going to score goals. And lo and behold, he, you know they were more confident and not worried about going backwards and working as working constantly back as they might have had to before. And they could do what they're good at, which was hurt teams really really frequently. And really powerfully and really beautifully at times. Martin, you mentioned earlier Pochettino. I've got to ask this question, and, and this isn't written down, by the way. Um, Pochettino and Jose Mourinho, the times of their sackings, was it right for you? I didn't agree with either dismissal. I wanted to give... I, I thought that, they, that what they needed to change under Pochettino was the dressing room and not the manager. And I yeah. think... And I think Subsequent events have proven that to be right. And I wouldn't have sacked Mourinho the week before the cup final. Yeah. Because 
he might have found a way to win that game. I'm not saying we'd have deserved to win it. We'd have been it would have been horrible. It would have been a horrible, scrappy one nil out of nothing with a gold off someone's backside. But he might have found a way to win that match. Yep. And I never thought and I think Ryan did a really good job and he's doing a really good job. Yeah. But you need to get if you're playing a really big game, you've got to be able to get into the the opposition manager's head. And there's no one better at doing that than Jose. And he and Pep does not like him. We, it's a real genuine nastiness between the two of them for different reasons. And it, it's a two-way street. It's not one of them or the other. It's both of them. And he might have just got into him and made him do something silly in the game. Because remember, a few months later, against Chelsea, he did do something silly. If he picked his normal team, he'd have won that Champions League final. He overcomplicates sometimes. And Mourinho yeah. would have tried to find a way to goad him into overcomplicating and giving Spurs an opportunity. Whereas he played against against Ryan in his first game game in charge, and Pep just said, "Go out and play. We'll beat this lot because we're better than them." And I'd, and that's not to be uh, detrimental or negative towards Ryan at all. It was his first managerial gig and his first game against Pep with all of those players. So I understand why many fans think that Pochettino uh, should have gone a little bit earlier. That Mourinho should never have been appointed and then should have gone earlier. But if you're asking me, I still say I thought both of them were premature dismissals. I think if it had carried on till Christmas with Pochettino, it would have been fair enough. Because you could say, actually, it had been a year of decline by, yeah. by Christmas. It started in the February, March, really, and it never never got any better. And the, yeah. the Champions League final run was actually a bit freakish and out of keeping with what was happening in the other games. But I'd have given him a bit more chance. Uh, and I'd have definitely kept him Mourinho to the end of the season. I think I probably would have done it then, but I'd have kept him to the end of that season. Martin, of course, the last transfer window, as you said, uh, Benton Kerr and Kulishevsky come in. Um, do you think that, that was the turning point, them two arriving? Oh, I think it was a, a huge decision. Uh, getting rid of a couple of bad apples as well helped, or players who weren't doing anything. Uh, I'm I'm really upset that Ndombele's not done it, but he's never going to be a Spurs player. So whatever you get from him, let him go. And I never saw a pl much of a player in Lo Celso, to be honest. Um, yeah. And no one saw a player in Hill because we haven't seen him kick a ball, apart from that penalty against Wolves at the start of the season. So those three disappearing improved the harmony within the squad unquestionably. More importantly, the two that came in got it. And straight away, or not straight away, but pretty swiftly, they were acclimatised. I think they fitted in very swiftly. They knew what they wanted to do. And that Conti knew what they could do. And it certainly gave, as an attacking team, having three up front who you could really hurt teams with, as opposed to two plus a half in Mora, who's not a bad player, mm. but I don't think anyone's scared of him. Whereas they were worried about Kudosevsky from very early on. They saw he had something different and he's on the same wavelength as as Kane and Son, which was was massive, and the and Bentancur can passable and can knit things together, and you see in him straight away a player, a really top top player. Now whether he'd have played as much if Skip hadn't been injured, we'll never know. It may yeah. have been him, and it may have been Skip and Bentancur, and no Hoberg. I mean, it's it, it it would have been two from the three, and they you know it, it might have been different. It also definitely helped Hoberg to have a player who he felt comfortable alongside. Um, and I think he did really well at the end of the season. I don't think I think he's a somewhat limited seven out of ten player, but seven out of ten every week is pretty good. And most weeks, certainly in the last three months, he was at least seven out of ten um, because Ben Tanko gave them solidity, shape, definition, made him a better team. And mm. they were two critical signings, no question about it. And it made everyone look and feel like better players. They hit the ground running straight away. When, when was the last players, you know, before those two um, at Spurs that, that you felt that come in and done the job straight away? Because, they, not, you know, a lot of signings seem to struggle, don't they? Yeah, not many do. I mean, look, it's took Son, I know he's got in his debut, but it took him a year to even get into the first team, didn't it? I mean, yeah. it took a long, a long while. I remember Chris Waddle coming in. It took him six months and he was an unbelievable player. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I'm old. I remember Chris Waddle. That's another matter. Um, it isn't easy. And that's why, you know, it, it, it took Doherty 18 months to look like he was at all able to play at Spurs. But it, I just felt it was too big for him. Sometimes the club is is too big for a player. 
you've seen, but even, you know, some of the real greats, Bergkamp and, and Henri Arsenal, they didn't do it automatically. Two, two of the greatest players in the history of the Premier League. It took mm. them a while. We shouldn't be surprised uh, that players do take away. So that where, where, where some do come in, it's possible to come in and be brilliant for eight games. And then you get found out. I know yep. I mean, that boy, was it? Um, there was a fellow at Southampton, a striker from Italy. I think he scored six in his first five games. Didn't score another goal because they get found out really quickly. And yep. yeah, there's so much uh, studying of the of the tapes and the defenders. And they know what to do and they, they work. And you've got to be able to readapt and, and change yourself, constantly evolving your game. And that was the great thing about Kulisewski because he was able to do that. And of, every time he, he ended the season, he came up with something new, it seemed. He was great at what he could, what we knew he could do, but he could do something else. Now, in the heart of midfield, when you're a give-and-go player, a knit-it-together player, you just have to be street smart. And that's what Ben Tancur is. He, you know, he's, he's a Uruguayan. He's been schooled in, in Italy. So he, I thought he would be swifter to come to terms with it. Um, particularly playing for for um, Conte, but the fact that Kulusevski was able to adapt so quickly and actually improve with every passing few weeks was a real testament to his capacity and work rate. I think. Martin, I want to talk about trophies, and of course, we've just mentioned Pochettino and Jose Mourinho, and of course, Jose Mourinho has won a trophy every single club that he's been at. Um, now we've got Antonio Conte. Surely we cannot go from. Pochettino to Jose Mourinho. I'm not even going to mention Nuno, but then go to Conte and not win a trophy. And as you said earlier, 2008, our last trophy. Surely Conte is the man. Well, I think so. But I've said yeah. that in the past and look really stupid. So I don't want to be... All I want is to see continued improvement. Yeah. And if there's continued improvement from this baseline, the natural consequence of that is winning things. Because look at where the starting point is. Fourth in the Premier League, having played half a season, a quarter of a season under a manager who wasn't fit for purpose. Um, I thought their performances in Europe were poor last season. I don't think they took it seriously enough. And then there was a the issue with the ring game. I thought the performance in the... I thought he, he gave up in the in the League Cup semi-final. I think it was a mistake to pick the goalkeeper he did for the, the game at Stamford Bridge. I really don't understand the thinking in that, but there, there you go. Um, and I thought they were pitiful at Middlesbrough. Yeah. But I'll accept all of that because of the way it finished. Um, and I suspect that they will give it a right good go in all the competitions. Remember, you only got to play three games in the League Cup. You're in the semi-final. Mm -hmm. Because of where you start, it's, it, and you know, so normally the first of those is a bit of a, sh of, a, of, a of a gimme. Certainly, it should be for Spurs with the quality of players they get. So you've only got to play two games to get to the quarter to the semi-finals. Well, come on, have a go. Uh, FA Cup. I'm not so fussed about. Although I'd like to win it, obviously. But I'm, if it was that or third, I'd take third any time. But I do think that there's no reason why, and I'm sure this is conscious thinking. He's looking at the most unusual season we've ever had coming up. We've never had a season with a six-week break that's supposed to be a six-week. Obviously, we had a three-month break three years ago, where that was everyone was in a two and eight there. No one knew what was going on until when it happened. But this is a, a you know, a, a six-week break where some players will be playing and others will be will be sitting at home not playing. And how do, how do you keep them fit? How do you keep them sharp when they're not playing? I, the ones who go away are going to be tired, but they're going to be sharp. The ones who stay at home are going to be not are not going to be tired, but they're not going to be sharp. So it's going to be mm -hmm. a really interesting dynamic. And you've got 22 league matches after Boxing Day or from Boxing Day onwards, which is a, a hellishly high number. Yeah. But I do think that you look at it and think, well, there's no reason why Spurs shouldn't be best of the rest behind Liverpool and City. And are Liverpool maybe not what Liverpool were, even with their new signing? Are City going to have to come to terms with it? I think they'll score loads of goals through Holland, but they're going to be different. And I still don't think they're great at the back. I think you can get at them, as we proved in that game at, uh, at the Etihad in February, March, where if you play cle cleverly, you can hurt them when you've got counter-attacking ability. And 
I think I'd be disappointed if Spurs weren't at least third. I really would. And I and I wouldn't see any reason why Conti doesn't think they can do better than that. Because I'm sure he does. Because he wouldn't have hung around. He wouldn't have got the players he's got in already if he wasn't thinking of, of making a proper challenge. He's not he's not a manager who plays for third, who plays for semi-finals. He's a manager who plays to win. That's what he's in it, he's, he's in it for. And I'm sure he's probably going to get a healthy financial bonus if he does as well. Do you, do you think, Martin, and this might be a ridiculous thing to say, do you think the Spurs could do um, a lot in this window, enough to challenge for the Premier League? I think it's possible. Yeah, I'm not, and that, that's. I don't want to say they're going to challenge because that would be specific. But if they get in the right back that they need, an aggressive attacking right wing back, if they get another body in midfield, and at least one who can play either as a second striker or as an option in the in the front three, I don't think they're a million miles away. Certainly from being, as I said the best of the of the other 18 but maybe better than that and in a season where i think it'll be fewer points required to win it because of the disruption so yeah. rather than 98 points it might take 89 points to win the title maybe 92 what's, then that's gettable what's your expectation for next year because antonio conte you know he I think he's come to Spurs because he wants to obviously win something. He wants to try and t challenge for the title. And of course, you know, when we talk about trophies, 2008 last League Cup, 1991 our last FA Cup, it's, it's unbelievable stats. And surely if Conte wins a trophy at Spurs, he will go down as a legend at the club. And, and, and that's what everyone's expecting uh, of him to guide us to success. Because when you consider last season, what he did, getting us into that Champions League spot, you know, with that very weird season that we had last year, you know, surely um, a trophy is definitely the next step. Well, he wants it unquestionably. Look, I, my minimum expectations are quarterfinals of the Champions League, third in the in the Premier League, and at least one final in the domestic cups. Now that may be hard, setting a high bar, but you it's know, not. You haven't set a trophy. Well, that's because I, I'm realistic. I think. Look. Also, I don't want to say win a trophy because then anything's a failure and you can be unlucky. You can get to a final and be unlucky. You know, yeah. I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? You know, if we're being honest, Liverpool should have won the Champions League this year. They shouldn't have won it when they did in 19. Sometimes the better team loses in the final because it can happen. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, that semi-final in the, of the cup when they lost to Chelsea 4-2 and they were, they were the better team, just Chelsea took all four chances they had because sometimes it happens. You just don't win when you deserve to win. And sometimes you win when you don't deserve to win. That that can happen too. That's the nature of, of, of the game. It needs what it can be one questionable decision that's not overturned when it should be or is overturned when it shouldn't be by VAR. All of these things can can turn things from success to, to, to failure. But if you're knocking loudly on the door, it's more likely to be opened. And that's what I want. I want to hear them banging on the door next season. Martin, um, so many people talk about the mentality um, of the club over the years, you know, the amount of semi-finals and finals that we've lost. Do you think Antonio Conte is changing that mentality? Do you, do you think that there is proof of last season that he's changing that slightly? Those last few games were the biggest sign of that, weren't they? Because the Arsenal game was one they had to win. Absolutely had to win. And they didn't just win, they they blitzed it. They they battered them. And in fact, in 90 minutes, Arsenal's entire season was destroyed, even though they had two matches left to play, because they couldn't, they were just a shell when they went to Newcastle a few days later, helped by a slightly dodgy penalty in Spurs' favour against Burnley. But, you know, yeah. that's how it goes. You know, they've, they've had, I've, Spurs have had bad decisions the other way against them, which have cost them. So it, it can happen. I'm not going to moan about a, a questionable one that goes your way as long as you accept the ones that go against. Um, what you found was a steely resolve when it mattered, actually, in a way we haven't seen before. Um, but sometimes you look back at it and things are different to what they actually were at the time. So in the, the season when we came second to Chelsea, 16-17, the run-in the run was brilliant. They just lost one game at West Ham. Mm. 
you know, and but unfortunately, it was it, you know, the one every other every game before, every game afterwards. Sometimes you just it doesn't work. It wasn't because they didn't want to win, it wasn't because they were trophy dodgers, they just didn't play well. And the yeah. chances they had didn't go in because sometimes they're human beings. Um, but what you do see with from this manager clearly is an absolutely manic desire to improve. And you see that rubbing off on the players. And what's really critical, of course, is he's, as to be fair, Mourinho did. He's got the key players on side because Kane loved play, Kane and Son loved playing for Mourinho. Because the game yeah. was about them. Yeah. The trouble was, not too many others did. Uh, now, I think the signings of him, Romero was a fantastic signing last summer. And I think that had he not been out for four months, the improvement might have come quicker. Mm-hmm. He was out for a long... He got injured in that very early season uh, Argentina game, didn't he? It wasn't bad. It was September, I think. He didn't see him again till January. I mean, it's a big, big gap. And, he's, and when he played, he was a key player. Um, Dyer found his legs and brain and, and heart and soul again, having been a shell. I think he just lost confidence in himself the previous year for lots of different reasons because it happens because he's human. And he yeah. came back and was terrific last season. And he was, for me, arguably, he was the best player. He was the player of the year, given where he'd been the previous year. You can argue, obviously, for Son and Kane because of goals and everything else. But on a human level, I thought Dyer was our player of the year. I thought he was absolutely fantastic because he showed more courage in himself than I'd ever seen from him. I thought he was brilliant uh, to yeah. come back from a, a pretty low ebb and make himself a critical player. I thought we, he deserves huge praise for that. And whilst the goalkeeper makes the odd rick, what I love about, as all managers do, love about old goalkeepers, is they don't worry about mistakes because they think that means the next one's seven games away. Whereas mm. young keepers worry about mistakes and that frees the next mistake. And actually, Luis didn't make too many, and he more than made up for it with the big saves he made. I, I think that there's there's a really positive vibe now. And I think critically and personally, the fans are buying into it too. They really believe that this is the manager who will make it happen. They wanted it to happen under Pochettino because of what he'd done. They put up with Mourinho because they thought he would be the manager who would actually deliver, even though a lot of them never really took to him and didn't want him. And this bloke, despite his two years at, at Chelsea, he wasn't ingrained in Chelsea. You know, he's a gun for hire. They think he's a real deal and they see yeah. the players responding to him and they respond to the players responding to him. And guess what? Then the players respond to them, responding to the players, responding to, to him. It's just, it is a virtuous circle. Martin, what, what's the definition of backing Antonio Conte this summer? Um, four more players of the quality he wants. Players that you know he wants. Now, because I don't you... know exactly who they are, but clearly Spurs are very interested in Jed Spence, and I'm assuming that's going to happen. He wanted Perisic. Now, Perisic is a very non-Spurs signing. No sell on value, experience. Conti said, I want him now. Go and get him. And they went yeah. and got him. Um, you know, the reserve goalkeeper is a reserve goal. I actually think that Forster will make a f- quite a few appearances and do, and he'll make some great saves and he'll drop a few in because that's what goalkeepers do. But he he's one of those, he's, he's exp- 34, he's not going to be worried about it. That helps enormously. Uh, and clearly, Basuma is a is a terrific signing. He was outstanding for Brighton. Every time I've seen him, I've been really impressed. He's a really top player. And again, that changes the dynamic. There's more quality straight away. So you then have potentially two from Basuma, Bentancur, Hoberg and Skip. Now, that's not bad. Yeah. You might want to play three occasionally there, but if it's two or three, you've got the option. That's that's pretty good because you can always occasionally play Kulisewski at wing, wing back, particularly on the right, possibly uh, in games. You don't have to be fixed about have playing. I think Doherty will, will stay and Emerson will go, but you know Spence and or Doherty, you could even mix it up a little bit. But he also needs to get the other players he wants. We need to have someone who can play centre forward who isn't Son, 
if Kane's injured or tired or ill or COVID or whatever it might be. Yeah. And that needs to be. Now, uh, the, looking, the fact that we're being linked with Rafinha and Richarlison tells you it's serious because they're not cheap. They're £60 million players. It may cost 50 million, it may cost 55, but that's the sort Spurs wouldn't go there. They did have a little tickle, I think, at Lautaro Martinez. If that was viable, they would still go back. I don't think it's going to happen, but they're having a look. He's going to buy a, a top left sided centre back. Now, which one of the four they're looking at it is, is not that important because he has said, right, well, get me one of these. I'd like Bastoni, I'd like Pau Torres, I'd like whoever get me one of these and as long as he gets one of those he will be happy and it means that Davis doesn't have to play every game which is good for Ben as well but he'll still be brilliant when he you know really solid when he comes in whether that be left side of centre half or occasionally a left wing back you know it's options there I'd love to have seen Ericsson but it appears that's not going to happen just because I want someone who can play that little 10 yard pass and one thing I thought we lacked at times was the ability to break down a mass defence and Ericsson and his pomp could do that. And I'd have loved to see it. And it, it's not impossible for that to happen, but I suspect it's not, at the, at the moment, going to happen. Well, apparently they, they spoke to Christian Ericsson and his agent a couple of weeks ago, and they've not returned any calls or spoke to them since. What? Why do you think that is, Martin? Because as a Spurs fan, you know, forget the fact that Ericsson has played for Spurs. I'm not being sentimental. Definitely not. You know, I see a quality player with Premier League experience, of course, what Antonio Conte wants, with Champions League experience as well, a real quality player. Um, why do you think that Spurs don't want Ericsson? I don't know, because I thought it'd be a perfect fit. You know, he doesn't have to play every game. He wouldn't do every game, but he'd be really useful. And I said, I'd love, when you're playing Burnley at home or Southampton, I'd rather have Ericsson in there just because he can do something. Yeah. Uh, then, and that's not to disrespect any of the others, that little bit of quality, even if it's in the last half hour, bring him on as a game breaker, someone who can change a match. I think it would be great, but it would appear that whilst they were half interested, it was no more than that. And maybe it's a degree of prioritization, but it's a free transfer, you only got to pay his wages, yeah, yeah. Um, and I'm sure he'd have agreed to come on a paper, you know. Pay paper play basis almost, you know, a two year contract on not a lot, you know, a, yeah. a minimum, uh, you know, a, a, a pretty decent but minimal by some standards salary with bonuses for games and goals or, or assists. I don't know. Um, it does appear that they're less than intent on it, unless they think that in the end that's where he wants to come and they can leave it to a little bit later. And if if it suddenly starts getting close to United or wherever, they might come in again. I don't know if that's the game that's being played. Mm, yeah. Um, the new signings you mentioned, uh, Perisic and Basuma, would you expect both of them to be starters on the opening day of the season? Yes. Yes, I would. I think um, I think it'd be great for Sessegnon to learn from a really experienced, wise old head in Perisic. Um and if you look at his stats for Juve last season, I think it's eight goals and nine assists or the other way around. But you know, really good from from wing back. He gets forward, he'll cross the ball, he'll be he'll be dangerous. He's smart. He can waste time if he needs to very well. And as I think Basuma was a standout midfielder at, at Brighton last year. He always appears to have time. Time on the ball, time to play, time creating space. Create. I think he's a terrific physical specimen as well but more importantly he's a very looks like a really intelligent football player so he's strong and, and all of those clear physical tropes but more importantly is he smart you see him creating space creating room and he will he will be he'll blossom in that environment i think and i think that's really good i mean whether it's hoberg who misses out or ben Tanku, i'm not sure one of them probably because it is southampton at home where you'd expect Spurs to, to have a lot of the ball. Yeah. Martin, um, that Basuma deal, it just seemed to come out of nowhere. No one seemed to speculate, no no reports, uh, you know, no tweets about it. Um, now, when you, when you think going back, like I remember the Klingsman deal in 94. I remember seeing that on the back of the newspaper, on the back of the Sun newspaper, um, seeing that that deal was done with uh, him standing there with Alan Sugar. Now, 
Um, talk us through like the change of uh, the way social media has changed the the fact that when a piece of news comes out now, it's just out there, isn't it? Yeah, I mean everything is live. Nothing. It's very hard to hold hold a story. In the old days, we used to try to you know hold things back for the paper. And unless you're the only person who's spoken to somebody and you know that they're not going to speak to anybody else, there is mu not much point in trying to hold it back for the newspaper anymore. You might as well just get it out online because it's going to come out anyhow. Um, yeah. Things have changed. And that's not neither good nor bad. It's just what is it? We're, you know, this is a 24 hour culture now. Um, and you've got to accept that that's that's it. And, I, you know, I use social media as a fantastic research tool. It really is brilliant, particularly if it's a breaking news story that I need to get over if something happened in South America I can find out from Twitter and then from links on Twitter far more information than I could sitting at home waiting for it to drop on the wires and that's no disrespect to PA and Reuters and everybody else uh, everyone is a journalist now everyone wants to put information out um, and you've got to accept that that is the nature of the beast and uh, and I do so you sometimes hold things back if you've got if you can yeah. but Often you can't. And it, right, it's, let's just do it. Let's get it written. Martin, many reports have stated that Antonio Conte still wants a right back, a centre back, a creative midfielder and a striker. Do you think that he is going to get everything on his shopping list? Yes. You I do. do? I do, yeah. I'm, the, only thing I, the one thing that surprised me is the Ericsson because I thought he was a creative midfielder. The right back is going to be Spence. I think it will be either Richarlison or Rafinha, the way it's going as the centre, as a striker. And... One of those we mentioned as the as the left sided centre back, he's going to get what he wants. Peretici has been out there doing the business. I think what's really interesting is that I suspect he'll have everything he wants by the time all the players are back for training next season. So rather than it being done on deadline day, what we'll do on deadline day is get rid of the dead that isn't wanted anymore. The ones who aren't going to have a, a role, they will be told by. The end of the last week in August. Sorry, pal. You might, if you want to play football, you have to move. Um, because have... pre-season, pre-season to Conte is extremely important, isn't it? Absolutely integral. Yeah. In my opinion, I think that he will want every single player in his squad before he goes on that plane to South Korea. I agree. I think that's his. The squad that starts the season, the ones who he's going to use and trust and utilize. Will yeah. be on that plane. I'm absolutely convinced of that because he wants to drill them. He wants them to play Conti ball to learn what's required of them, and he believes he's a trainer, a coach. He believes that you do it by method. You work and work and work, and then when you're rested, you work even harder. And it's you repetition and drills, good ones and inventive drills, but still working to make things all all to automatic make the movement automatic that's what he wants for people to know their positions know their roles and he believes if you do that and it's, it, look at what he's done throughout his career he's been a success doing that he won the league with victor moses at right back mm. yeah you know there you are he won the yeah. league in italy he won, he won the league in italy with ashley young playing at, at wing back i mean it's he gets players he puts players in the right holes and makes them work. And even if they're not necessarily somebody else's first choice, if he thinks he can mould them into the player he wants them to be, he's very happy. But he wants everyone to be in their mould. He doesn't want anyone to break free of it, really. Martin, there's been reports out today saying no direct talks uh, with Spurs and Everton for a Charleston yet. Antonio Conte wants a versatile striker or a versatile forward. Do you think Richarlison will fit in to this Tottenham Hotspur squad? Because every time I've mentioned Richarlison on this channel, a lot of people are not that keen. I think he scored 12 goals last year in a very average Everton. He scored goals for a very average Watford. If he plays in a better team, he scores goals for Brazil when he plays. He's got a hat-trick. I saw him in the, in the Olympics at, in Tokyo. If he plays for a better team, he'll be a better player. He will have no excuses with Conte and he will be desperate to play in a team that can win something. And he yeah. believe he'll, he'll come believing that that's why he's come to Tottenham, that they'll, he'll be part of the reason they get over the line. And there's nothing wrong with vanity in a player because it might make them better players. You need that self-possession, 
self-confidence. And he's certainly got that. And yeah, there are times when you think he's a little bit lackadaisical. But he's never been in at any time since he's been in England. He's always known that he's the best player. He's the striker. Yeah. Well, he has got to prove that at Spurs because he knows that he's got to get in the, in the same team that already includes Son and Kane and Kulisevsky. Now, two of those are top five scorers in, in the league last season and the other one did pretty well, you know. So for him to get in the team, he's going to have to play and play and play again. But there'll be a, an impetus and desire to do that on his part and I think that um, that would work. And I think he's a real chance. I think Chelsea wants him as well. He's going to have to make it. If it comes down to money, I suspect at the moment Chelsea could still offer more. Though we don't actually know that because no one knows what new Chelsea are going to be. We know what old Chelsea were, but this isn't old Chelsea. This is new Chelsea. And we don't know. We do know that Spurs are financially now in the position that they were supposed to be when the ground was built. This ground was built to get £6 million in, every home, in through the gate every home game. Now it's happening. So there's that huge uh, cash fund that's available. Sponsorship. This year, Champions League money of £30 million without kicking a ball probably ends up being 50 to £60 million if they do half decently. £140 million last year for Premier League money, which will be even more next year. Um, because the yeah, that'd be you know, come third, come third, it'll be 165 million next year, uh, because of the extra value of the overseas TV deals. So, you're suddenly talking about a club that, if it has a good season next season, could be grossing half a billion pounds in revenue. And even if you stick to 60 percent of revenue to wages, that's a 300 million pound wage bill, hmm. which is an awful lot more than Spurs have had in the past, yeah. Martin, with, with Richarlison, where does he fit in? Would, it, would he come in and be a sub? Would he be that player that we've been missing? Because I say this on this channel a lot as well. 2017, the last striker we actually signed on a permanent basis, uh, which, of course, was uh, Fernando Llorente. I know we had Carlos Vinicius and Gareth Bale on loan. Um, but as far as actually signing a striker on a permanent basis, that was the last one. Um, where does Richarlison fit in for you? Like, If we did sign him, opening day of the season, is he going to be that sub coming off the bench, replacing uh, someone like uh, Steven Bergwijn, for instance? Yeah, I think he replaces Bergwijn in the squad. Uh, but I think he gets more starts. I think he'll get, given the number, you know, so in the first splodge of the season, you've got 16 league matches, two League Cup matches, and six Champions League matches. That's 24 games. Yeah. Howie Kane is not going to start 24 games. He can't. If we, but also, if you have Richarlison, Son, Berg, uh, Kane, and Kulusevski, and maybe Mora still, he doesn't need to start 24 games. He can start 15, 16, maybe more, maybe less. Richarlison can start 10. Son can have breaks. So when they do play, they're fitter, they're fresher. You suddenly yeah. have more, more. You get more out of each players, each player, by using them less. Martin, there's a, there's a question here from Paul, and it says, uh, best available versatile forward out there is uh, presently is Dybala. Now, um, Dybala apparently was um, requesting so much wages, wasn't he? Did, did you ever see a deal being done for him? Um, well, I think money makes it difficult, but also I think Inter is where he wants to go. I think he wants to stay in Italy. Um, so I think it's unlikely he comes. But, of course, if he does move into Inter and they've got Lukaku, well, it's a Martinez. Yeah. And that could change, that could, you know, a brick, a, that could dislodge that and that could make him available. So there's still a period of, of uncertainty that could change in the next couple of weeks. And also, once people get back from their holidays at the end of June, I think it'll be a very, there'll be a lot happening in the first two weeks of July. I think yeah. it'll be very, very busy from, you know, next, next Saturday or from maybe the second third of july from the monday i think we'll have a very busy period of lots of deals all over the place because things are going to move because the season starts a week earlier as well so things are going to be expedited um the jibala is a talented player of that there's no question um but i i'm not sure that that's going to happen i mean at the moment i would i would put it in minimal terms really rather than possible terms 
Do you think we're going to get a real statement signing this summer? Because I say this a lot on this channel. The last time I was really, really excited was Klingsman in 94. Now, we signed a world-class player, world-class player at the time. When was the last time you were really excited about signing? I was excited about Ndombele. I really was. I thought he was going to be brilliant. Shows how clever I am. Um, <laughs> do you think you're ever no. playing a Spurs shirt again? No. Nor do I want him to. <laughs> I can't believe that there's a, a professional footballer Yeah. can't last 60 minutes. Yeah. I think it's pathetic. You know, it's I... his job. And he can't last 60 minutes. And the last time I looked, it's 90 minutes in a match. Yeah. It's utterly ridiculous. Really, really poor, I think. I'm very, you know, I, I feel uh, desperately annoyed at his attitude because there's clearly a player there, yeah. but there's not a professional there. And I, yeah. I think he's let himself down horrifically and I don't want to see him again. I'm sorry. I don't, it, it, I, it, he hasn't tried. I, you know, I'm not convinced that Bergwijn is good enough and I'm not going to be devastated if he goes. But I don't doubt he's tried every time he's come on the pitch. He mm. really has. Emerson yeah. Royal has tried every match. He's just simply not good enough. I mean, he's like uh, he's not the worst defender in the history of the club. There's a few really bad ones we've had over the years, to be fair. But he's certainly not a good attacking fullback, is he? I mean, crikey. The ones he puts in the right place are the, the miss kicks. I'm pretty sure when he tries to play, he puts it all over the shop. He's just not very good, you know. And it's he's obviously a much better football player than I'll ever be. I'm not trying to pretend otherwise, but he's not good enough for the standard of football that we're looking at. So um, there's a few I don't, I won't be unhappy with if if they disappear. Um, and Ndombele, I'm afraid, very much one of those. You know, go, never come back. Good luck. Take your money. Well played. See ya. Do, and do well for France. Do well for Leon yeah. or wherever you go next. I'm no, I don't have any animosity. I want him, I want, I'd like him to be the player he can be, but he's never going to be that player for Spurs. It's funny though, isn't it? Spurs seem to be criticised a lot for not spending money, but when you think £100 million between uh, Celso and Ondombele, and neither of them worked out or, or even completed that many matches, 90 minutes, as you said. Um, what I wanted to ask you, Martin, is about Ben Davis because we keep targeting um, left-sided centre-back. Is it unfair on Ben Davis? No, because he'll get plenty of football and he can play left-back. There'll be games he'll play left-wing-back. There'll be games he'll play, come on for the last 20 minutes to show a match-up. Um, he'll still play plenty of football and, you know, he's been at the club quite a long time now. He was in the swap with Sickerson, wasn't he, all those years ago when, when, when Vaughan came in. So what's that? Eight years? Nine years? Yeah, it's quite. It's a long time, and he's without any disrespect to Ben, he's not a young man anymore. Um, he played really well, but played too much last season. He shouldn't have had to play as many games as he did, and I think he did really, really well because he never lets you down. I mean, you watched him play in that playoff for Wales. He was absolutely magnificent, wasn't it? Those blocks yeah. he made. So yeah. you still and clearly Conte loves his attitude. And we'll want him as being a, a member of the squad and a player he can trust and rely on. And if that means playing in the away game in Europe, which they think they're going to win, well, fine, good, let him play. Uh, in the League Cup, in a match that they think they can win at home to give other players a rest, whoever it might be. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's, that's the idea of squad players who you can trust and rely on. And they still get plenty of football, but they're not in the nominal first eleven. Well, that's all right. Do I you think, think he's get enough money? He's been paid enough. He don't, he don't think he's that unhappy about life, is he? Yeah. Do, do, do you think there's many players that were possibly going to be heading out the door this summer, but Antonio Conte has improved them and, and, he, and he's changed that decision? I think Doherty is the one of all of them. Um, I don't think he fancies Regulon. He'll go. Obviously, Galina has gone back. As we said, he'll, Lo Celso, Ndombele, Bergwijn. They all go, I think, and hope, in truth. Not so much that hope with Bergwijn. I just think it's time for him. He needs to play football, to be fair. That's what I always do. I'd, I'd rather players went and played football than, than hang around not playing because it's their job and it's it's a pretty short career. And, I, you know, I think in the same way, I love Harry Winks. I think he needs to go. And I'd be really sad to see him go. 
but he need for his own sanity he needs to go to a club where he's going to play football whether that be southampton or villa or everton or wherever it is go and play football i think he never really recovered i think he lost half a yard after the injury and i don't think he's ever got it back because at, at that point when he before he got injured he was a real, he would have going to go to a world cup no question in 2018 if he hadn't been injured he was going to be part a key part of that england team and then he got injured and he never came back Martin, comment on screen now. Um, do you think uh, Kim Min Jae is a good option? Do you know much about Kim Min Jae? He's another one they've looked at, and they, the other boy is the Hink Hinkapi, the Ecuadorian. Yeah. Um, so they've they've looked at a lot. It's about a cert, there's a certain degree of grade of centre half that they're looking at. Um, I think the Korean boy is slightly below the top level of what they look of of their list at the moment. He's on the list, I think. But I don't think he's necessarily at the top of it. Uh, and I think he, he's a possible rather than a probable. I think it will probably be one of Bastoni or Pau Torres as the most likely. But it could be neither of them, in which case you go to the others who are on the list. With these with these players, um, you said that you think Conte will get his full shopping list, right back, centre back, creative midfielder and a, and a versatile striker. Do you think that... Um, Conte and Fabio Pratchi are concentrating on Premier League proven players, or don't you think it matters because the likes of Kulusevski and Benton Kerr come in from Serie A? No, they're looking at players. I mean, Quality. It, 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 yeah, it's about ability. Now, look, yeah. Richarlison or Rafinha obviously are both Premier League proven players, but Spence is not. He's only playing the Championship. Uh, none of the centre halves they're looking at played in the. Um, in the Premier League. I mean, Ericsson obviously would have been proven. I wouldn't be shocked if they had a little tickle at Madison, I have to say. Because um, I see a lot of Ericsson in Madison and vice versa. And I know Madison has an interesting reputation. Not the most popular boy with certain members of the England establishment, it's fair to say. But he can play. Yeah. And he's a younger version of Ericsson. And I think and he, you know, he can take free kicks, so that take Harry off free kicks, which we'll all be happy about. Um, he can pass a ball, he can score, he can cross. I think he's a very, very good player. And I wouldn't be, if he was to be someone there to go out and got, I would not be unhappy at that at all. That's a quality player who would fit the bill and, again, be able to give those little 10, 15 yard passes. You know, the balls he plays into Vardy and the sort of pass that Kane and Son would love. What about James Ward-Prowse? Great engine. Great set piece. Good boy, I'm told. Really good fella. People, everyone tells me he's a really nice, nice chap. Is he a game changer? I knew there was a but. Sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. he's. A, I think he's a good Premier League player. Yeah. And he would have been an excellent Spurs signing three or four, five years ago. I'm not entirely convinced that he's necessarily what they need now. I think what they've got already with Skip and Bentancur and Besuma and Hobo covers the skill set, with the exception, I suppose, of a free kick taker, because obviously Ward France is as good a free, take, free kick taker as anybody in the Premier League. Surely Hun Min Son should be on the free kicks now, shouldn't he? Well, him rather than than Harry, please. It was a belting wow. score the other week, wasn't it? Um, yeah, but I said if 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 it were if Madison were to come in, you'd have, you wouldn't be a problem having him take them, would you? Um, so that would be. But I think Son should take them. Yes, at the moment he's got the best. Or Dyer. Dyer yeah. is a fantastic dead ball striker. Yeah, I mean, he's gotten that, but he he hits a hell of a good good free kick. You know, Trippier Martin, used to do that, didn't he? He had that yeah. ability to score an absolute belter from distance. Yeah. Um, Harry Kane, do you think that Harry Kane will now finish his career at Spurs? His senior career, yes. I think he'll end up going to the States and play two years of MLS. Oh, OK. Yeah. But as a, at, up until he's 33, 34, unless things go absolutely belly up this year, I think he wants to stay. I think he, I, I never believed he wanted to leave. It was just that he couldn't stay in his mm. head. 
it was it wasn't because he wanted to go it was that he felt he had to go because the club was in free fall that was his view of it and i think he was let down by city because they gave him promises that they didn't deliver which was a mistake on their part because they could i think they'd have won the champions league with him last season because he just scored those goals that matter because that's what he does um but that's great for spurs he's got he's 20 goals less than 20 goals behind jimmy greaves now so he breaks that record uh this season and he leaves Spurs, hopefully with two Premier League titles, but also for him, equally important, if not more so, uh, breaking Shearer's record as the top goal scorer in the history of the Premier League. I think he gets five or six more years at Spurs, and I think he, he scores 18 to 20 goals a season on average over those years. Martin, of course, um, Harry Kane in his younger days uh, went out on so many loan spells. Um, Troy Parrott has just come back from MK Dons. He's about to come back to Hotspur Way. Um, what do you see um, Troy Parrott doing in the near future? Do you think he will stay at Spurs this season? Do you think he'll be on the sub bench Because, of course, we can use five subs in the Premier League from start of next season. Or do, you, or do you think that Spurs will send him out on another loan? He'll go on loan either to a top, top six championship club or a bottom six Premier League club. Okay. He needs to play football. He needs to toughen up like Harry did. He doesn't have yeah. to necessarily be prolific there. He needs to learn to be a man in a man's world. And that, you know, he did well last year at, out on loan, didn't he? He scored goals, yeah. um, some good goals. He felt more confident there, I think, he did when he was at Millwall because it, it takes time. You've got to learn to be more at home with yourself. There's clearly talent. He needs one year, maybe even 18 months, two years, learning his trade before he's going to be ready. In the same way that they'll make do the same thing at some point with Scarlett, though he'll probably stay and be on the bench all this season and get 10 minutes here and 15 minutes there and seven minutes away to Bratislava or whatever it might be. Um, uh, hopefully it'd be Frankfurt, actually, because we'd like to draw them in the, <laughs> in the, as, the as the top seed in the Champions League group. Um, but I think Scarlett will stay and be in around the squad, but Parrot will go out on loan. It's funny, I went onto the uh, the BT Sport website and uh, your profile on there, it says he has covered England every major championship since Euro 96 and he knows how to catalogue disappointment, which made me laugh. Um, now, covering England, will you be going out to Qatar at the end of the year? I will, yes. I'm, I've got yeah. there for five weeks. I go on the 14th of November and I'm back on the 19th of December. What do, what do you expect and uh, what, what you, what's your expectations for England and the World Cup? I think they go very deep. Um I don't. I dismiss what we saw last few weeks because no one cared. It was utterly meaningless matches, to be honest. It will matter in in November. I think the winner of the likely quarter final between France and England wins the tournament. I think okay. two, they'll be the best two teams in it. I actually. I mean, I know Brazil were at top of the rankings and Argentina were third and Spain are good. England have got more quality players than we've ever had before, and I know. A lot of fans think that Gareth Southgate is a bit negative. Look how France won the World Cup. Solid base and let your two or three superstars win the game for you. And that's what he will look to do. And that's Kane and Foden, maybe Sterling, maybe Grealish, off the bench with Grealish, I think, maybe Mount. There's quality there. They can win games. Uh, if he, and the, the midfield is stronger now. I think Rice is a fantastic player. I know Chelsea really want him. Whether they, and he wants to play for Chelsea, just making the right bid. He might have to wait a year, but he's, a, he's like I'd have him tomorrow. I think he's fantastic. But he, he's set on going back to Chelsea so he can stay in Kingston for the rest of his life, uh, which is fair enough. Kingston's a lovely town. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think England will go a long way. Yeah, I really, really do. I, I have no reason to, to think otherwise. Doesn't mean they'll win it. But I think they go deep. Uh, I think they're very, very good. It's funny, Martin. I say to a lot of uh, people that I know that don't support Spurs, saying that supporting Tottenham and, and, and supporting England and going and watch all the England games, as I do, it's very similar, isn't it? Yeah, because you know it's going to end. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of excitement and then oh, crushing disappointment. But I thought, you know, the Euros were fantastic. They played, they played yeah. extremely well. And... Everyone seems to forget that they lost a penalty shootout against Italy. Yeah. It was a one-all draw. And yes, Italy were the better team for an hour and a, an hour or so. 
But it was a two-hour match, and the other half hour, either side, England were probably the better team. In extra time, yeah. England were the better team. The first half hour, England were markedly the better team. Italy yeah. deserved to win, I think, because when England were better, they were better, you know, proportionally than England were better than Italy in that period. But there was nothing in it. And if the Rashford penalty goes in rather than coming out off the post, England win the shootout because all the pressure's on, on Italy at that point. So... It, it can be really tight. It is small, small details, as every Italian manager would always tell you. Yeah, it, it's going to be a strange period, though, isn't it? Even for football fans, as you mentioned earlier about the players that not going on international duty, that, that, that break of the 12th of November right up to, to Boxing Day, where, of course, you know, December, we, we used to fixture after fixture after fixture. I think it's like seven Premier League fixtures in the matter of three months. It's going to seem strange, isn't it, for everyone? Yeah, it's going to be really, really odd. Um, you're used to having seven games in, in, in December. Yeah. You know, and suddenly there's nothing in, in, in a six-week break, which is, we've never had this, other than the mad madness of COVID, we've never had it before. And we'll probably yeah. not have it again for 25, 30 years. Uh, I think that we'll, we'll go back to the golf at some point, but not for until there's been a full cycle of matches elsewhere. So it, not in my lifetime as I'm 55. So it is a one-off experience for most players and most fans as well. Um, yeah. And it does change the dynamic of the season without question. Um, how they come back, mindset of those that come back, depending on how their teams have done. Um, it's interesting. If you look at the psychology of football, I defy anyone not to tell me that the the thing, the moment that changed last season for Liverpool was Mo Salah not qualifying for the World Cup because he wasn't the same player after Egypt got knocked out. Didn't, he was just slight, he was slightly off. He was still a very, very good player, but he was off. He wasn't what he would be. He, he was the crushing disappointment of missing out on penalties for the second time in a couple of months against Senegal for the second time in a couple of months against Mane for the second time in a couple of months, it really affected him because footballers are human beings. So we don't know if if England do really well, if England win it, let's say, Kane coming back as the hero of the tournament because he would have scored more goals than anybody else. He'd have you know, gone past Nineke and he might have scored 10 goals, six goals in the finals and what the golden ball again. Comes back, is he, I can't wait to play again or... What do I do now? You know, you don't know. Um, yeah. It's in, because no one's ever gone straight from a World Cup tournament within a week into domestic football. It's never yeah. happened before. We just don't know. Impossible to say how players will respond. Do you think that that is going to be an extremely busy January transfer window? Um, because everyone's been showcased in that World Cup. Do you think it's going to be uh, even more activity than ever before? I don't think there's enough time for people to work out what they need. They're and cramming also, it all in. Yeah, they've got to cram all the matches in as well. They, I, I think it will be one of those where there'll be the teams at the bottom might do a bit, but I don't think there'll be an awful lot of messing around. You're only allowed to change three players in the Champions League squad as well between yeah. uh, group stage and knockout. So yeah. wholesale changes are less likely for the bigger clubs because of that. Um, what I do think is that those who perform well will be wanted and they'll set up in January deals for, for July. Mm. Martin, last question for you on screen here. Um, is Saar the forgotten young player? Do you expect him to go back out on loan or do you think Antonio Conte will use him for next season? Well, he'll look at him, but he's never seen him play, has he? And he was at no. Mets all of last season. I mean, he might have seen him play on tape, but he won't know him at all. No. Um, so we'll look at him in training and see what's there. Um, he's still very young. He played in and out in a team that got relegated last season. So he'll want to go, if he goes back to France, which would be the obvious place, it would be a team that's in Ligue 1 rather than one that's that was in Ligue 2. Ligue 2. Um, so I suspect he might think he's not quite ready uh, and that one will want to... Get, it might be more sensible actually if you put him out on loan to a Premier League club to 
a Bournemouth, a club like yeah. that where he won't play every game, but he'll play a lot and he'll learn to play. Yeah. Um, and it does mean probably a relegation zone team, Fulham or Bournemouth, maybe Brentford. Those are not. I think Brentford did really well last year, by the way. But I think second season syndrome may make it harder for them, particularly without Ericsson if he's not staying. Um, I think that would be the best thing for him. Would really get experience of playing English football now, actually, and rather than going back to France. So I go back on what I said a minute ago. That was absolute nonsense. Uh, get him, send him out on loan. Unless she looks at him and think, wow, this boy can play. But he'll have to look at him because I don't think, as if anyone who tells you they know is making it up because we haven't seen him. We haven't got a clue. Well, what, what do you make of the Brian Hill situation? Because, of course, he came in last last summer, a part of the uh, Lamella deal uh, under Nuno Espirito Santo, and then, of course, gone out on loan. Do you think we're going to see him in a Spurs shirt again? I'd rather have Jimmy Hill in a Spurs shirt, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> He looked, he looked so lightweight, didn't he? I mean, puff of wind would knock him over. It seemed. But but um, but does it help him, him him going out on loan abroad? Does that help him coming back? And no. and be no, no, it doesn't. I mean, it just gets it. What it did do was give him football to play, and he yeah. apparently did quite well over back in Spain. Um, but if he's if he's going to be a Tottenham player, he's got to learn to play in English football. Yeah. Which is it's just more physical by the nature of it. It just is. There's nothing we can do about it. Whether for good or ill, it's a more physical league uh, where yeah. more re referees allow more to go on. The skullduggery is 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 different to to other leagues. And, you know, there's plenty of skullduggery in Spain and Italy and Germany as well. It's just more obvious in England what you can get away with. You've got to be more robust. Um, and the way to be robust is to play and get used to playing in a more physical league. Um, you know, look at someone like Ronaldo. He was a specimen at 17, let yeah. alone what he became. You've got to be able to cope with the physics. You don't have to be massive. That is silver wasn't big, but he was he was really nimble and very, very clever. Juan Mata at Chelsea in particular, less so at United, but at Chelsea in particular, not big physically. But very, very clever football player. Found the half spaces. Found, so it, Hill's got to be able to find a way to do it. We didn't see enough of him to think that he can't do it. We didn't see enough of him to think he can do it. That's the problem. We just didn't see any of it. That, the one game I remember was him scoring the penalty against Wolves in the shootout. That's about it. Mm. And I think he played in one of the European games. It was absolutely awful, wasn't he, at the start? Embarrassingly yeah. bad. Martin, lastly, um, tell us about the book that you've written on White Hart Lane. Well, that was a long time ago, and I had hair and everything. No, it was, it was a labour of love, uh, I've got to be honest. Um, so it was a, sort of a, a, a history of Spurs through the eyes of lots of people, through fans, uh, players, managers, the people who work at the club, uh, and also genuine history, going back, trawling through the, the archives to find, and uh, trying to find a way of writing it in a way that was that was entertaining I hope uh, my own personal stories weave through it as a growing up as a boy as a fan becoming a journalist and covering the club and all of those those things as well uh, and then some vignettes I think you call it of you know the last game at White Hart Lane that season it was really I mean I was very lucky that a lot of people wanted to talk to me people I, who I like people I don't like occasionally one or two of them but that's that's not a bad thing that you talk to people um, and I like certain people who other people at the club don't like. I've got to be honest. I, you know, I get on with George Graham. I always have. I think he's he's always been brilliant with me. So I know that a lot of Spurs fans don't. We never took to George. I've always taken to George. You know, it's one of those things. Um, Can I ask Martin? You, you mentioned David Pleat earlier having a go at you. Is, is there anyone um, at Spurs over the years that that didn't like you or what you do? Oh, Jerry didn't like me at all. Jerry Francis really didn't like me. <laughs> <laughs> and I like Jerry. He just he, he thought I was the biggest pain in the bum he's ever had. He really didn't. Because the thing about Jerry, it was a, there was a bit of a joke. You know, the press conference was was at two o'clock GMT, which stood for Jerry Mean Time, because it could be anything between two and six, and he'd keep you waiting really? and waiting and waiting. 
which is it is prerogative but after come on i've got a job to do here. i'm wasting six hours on you know it was a schlep to get to Luxford Lane at the best of times as you know um and there were times oh can you get on with it and i used to sort of when it wasn't he had this thing he was another one who would come out with these stats you know i'm the first spurs manager since so and so to do this and i'd look up the stats and say no you're not actually if you, that's yeah. not correct is it he didn't like being called on that but that's all right it's fine he, i mean i thought they played there's some great football that season absolutely fantastic um but it was a donut wasn't it you know a team with a hole in the middle which doesn't really didn't really work um did you did you cover the Christian Gross days? I did. I, I, I was bizarrely um, the ridiculous, ludicrous answer he gave about the the tube ticket was in direct response to me asking him a question about what he knew about the history of the club and traditions of the club, which was an actually an answer, but a really good one for for us as journalists. Uh, that that, that, that was you that prompted the ticket. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I still don't know why. I mean, obviously, it was a setup. He knew he'd, he was always going to do it, and he thought that was the one that gave him the excuse to to whip out his his, his ticket from, from Seven Sisters. I'm assuming he got a, a, a cab, a, a, a car from Seven Sisters rather than walking down the high road. I must admit, but we'll never know. He definitely wouldn't have gotten the one four nine or the two seven nine, would he? That's for certain. Uh, but there you go. Um, yeah, Martin. I've had a few, but. Most of them I actually got on all right with that. I mean, that's you know, I I try to be straight. People don't always like it. And I've heard Pleaty love him to bits, always have done. We had one row. We've had one row in 30 years. And he and yeah. what he did, he wound down the window. Lipton. Lipton. Yes, David. You're supposed to be a bloody Spurs fan. <laughs> wound it off and went away. <laughs> that was it. You know, he and that's part of the fun. He knew, I knew. We just got on and I've, I've always been really grateful to David. He's been fantastic help to me over the years, uh, whether he is a Spurs manager in his other roles, uh, at other clubs, when I've met him in his job working for you know t uh, radio and TV uh, as well. I wouldn't have a bad word to say about him. He's a brilliant fellow, really is. So, I mean, most of most of them, I've had, I've had lots of I liked AVB. I yeah. really did. I thought he was a, a, a I still like him. I, I went to see him. I saw him in Lisbon last year. And it was like oh, old mates again. It was really strange. I hadn't seen him for about five years. And I, I think he was he was a bit unlucky. I think I knew why he had to go. He'd made it impossible, but he wasn't necessarily wrong in everything he said. And he was a better manager than Tim Sherwood was, if I'm going to be brutally honest. Um, yeah. And he got the best out of Gareth Bale. There's no doubt about that. And better that Bale was better under AVB than anybody else because he basically said to Gareth, "You're my player. I'm going to build the team around you." Gareth loved that. Yeah. Martin, you, you've been an absolutely fantastic guest. I tell you, I, I could talk to you all night about Tottenham. Um, so I'd love you to come back on again. Oh, absolutely um, if, love you, Chris, yeah. Um, the, the comments for you and the love for you has been absolutely fantastic tonight. So thanks so much for your time. Um, please do tell everyone where they can find you on social media and uh, what you're up to at the moment. Yeah, I am at Martin Lipton uh, on Twitter and... I am about to go to Wimbledon. Uh, so, by the way, that's, so one of the question, questions there is, what's the name of the book? It was um, White Hart Lane, The Spurs Glory Years, 1889 to 2017. Available we, we, in all, we'll, we'll, we'll put the link. We'll put the link. Yeah, so in, in, in all bad bookshops. Actually, not that many anymore, sadly. But it's around and about. You can get it on, on Amazon, I think. But no, I, if you want to read it, please do. As I said, it was a labour of love. I've got Wimbledon this year. I've got the Commonwealth Games. I've got the World Cup. Um, Oh, crikey. I've got lots on. I'm really lucky. As I said, one day I will have to get a proper job, but I'm trying to put it off for as long as I can. Well, hopefully it will be a busy season and hopefully you'll be writing about Spurs winning a trophy at the end of it. So fingers crossed. But Martin, thanks so much for, for coming on. Really appreciate your time. And thanks uh, to everybody for watching and listening. If you're listening to this on an audio uh, podcast as well, and I'll see you on the next one. Until then, come on, you Spurs.